All right, Eric. Here we go. Uh, thanks for coming in. Friend of Diego's is a friend of mine. Right on. Um, and you've known him for like 15 years from the fight world? Roughly, yeah. How long have you been in that world? Uh, let's see. I started fighting professionally in 2005. I fought some underground fights in New York City before that. What is an underground fight? So it's it not like, like Fight Club. Is it? Unsanctioned. It was in like a loft yeah. in like a, in Manhattan. Illegal. No doctors. No no nothing. Just it sounds like a human no, cockfight. No glo- yeah, essentially. Wow. Yeah, kind of like yeah, like if you like like a kumite type shit. You know, just yeah, like an underground fight. Mm. Illegal and guys going in there to fight. So is that more brutal than like I imagine? It's more gets a little bit more brutal. In a fight yeah, like yeah. Well, I mean. Yes, uh, like there was no rules per se. So like, you know, I could knee somebody in the temple while they're on the ground, which you couldn't do in a, in a professional fight. I saw a guy bring his kids to one of these fights, get his arm snapped, um, and then just be kind of like shuffled off to the side with his kids. Yikes. Yeah. And no doctors or nothing like that. Why would no you gloves. Your kids to that. That guy really needed the money. <laughs> I don't know why he did that. Yeah. Um, it seems like such a rough, thing to me to be your main gig you know sure you know is it a, is it a tough life I'm, i mean has to be yeah fighting i mean for a lot of people particularly like in the era that i grew up in so like i'm 41 um this is i got started prior to the ultimate fighter and like um when the ultimate fighter the ultimate off, fighter was the show that really like threw mma into the mainstream okay, okay. so they did it on spike at the time before ultimate fighter was a different thing well, no, it was still it was still the UFC. The Ultimate Fighter was a reality show. But yeah, yeah, I right. Get it. But it was a different like it was a different landscape. Then. Yes, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You did not have today. You have like serious. It's athletes. You know, there's a lot yeah. of athletes getting yeah. involved. Um, and you know, some of them come from troubled backgrounds. But when when I was coming up, it was not something that you sought to do as a career. You right. did this out of you know a lot of us are just looking for a way to get out that shit. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I just started training so I could rob drug dealers better. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a good, I mean, if you're robbing drug dealers, you want to know how to fight. Yeah. You, know? you don't want to not have that. Yeah. That's, I just want to be, I just wanted to be able to hurt people in the street more. Is it where you get into a lot of street fights? Yeah. By the time I was in fifth grade, I had gotten into 50 and I, cause I would keep meticulous track. And you uh, would. yeah, I, I, uh, Did I you a, keep track of your record too. I did until after a while. It just got so far above 50, I couldn't keep track anymore. I was just getting into so many fights um, that I couldn't keep track. But I remember like keeping track and being so proud that I had this, this, I'd been in 50 street fights. Sometimes I'd go out and like get in like three or four in an afternoon just to fucking pump up my numbers. How would you get in that many fights? Just go pick a fight. Just pick a fight. It's not that hard. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. New York in the 90s, Long Island in the 90s, you know, middle class working neighborhood is not hard to just go out and. Pick a fight where, like, where is like the most, like, unexpected place you had a fist fight with somebody? Oh man! I mean, as a kid, it could break off anywhere. We would just be playing, you as know what kid, I mean? Yeah, as, yeah, a, kid, as a kid, yeah. it's not that hard. Yeah, yeah, you know. So I'm talking fifth grade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is what are you ten in fifth yeah, grade? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we just got me out playing and just might just shove somebody, start an argument. All right, now now let's get it cracking. You uh. I have to imagine, like, you had, like, an early experience, maybe I'm wrong, where, like, you were probably winning a lot of these fights, and it gave you a sense of confidence. A million percent. So, yeah. yeah so it's the, a positive feedback loop. A million percent. Uh, so, I had a couple of early bullying inc- incidences, and uh, I remember crying after, like, getting my head slammed into a window. This is, like, third grade, right? Um, so, I'm maybe nine years old. And I remember crying, and it wasn't the pain that I was crying; it was the helplessness that, right. that I felt. And uh, and I grew up in an abusive household, so like everybody right. in my house was weak except for my father. And so, um, and I didn't have any male role models, but I had '80s action movies, right? right. And so, yeah. what do you learn in '80s action movies? If you if you kick enough ass, right, and don't show any feelings, you'll get the girl, and everybody will like you at the end. Yeah. Right. So that's, that's literally what I, that's the model I had for a man was those 80s action movies, right? Very like specific sense of what a man is supposed to be Mm -hmm. when it comes down to danger and and all that stuff. And so, yeah, I kind of like lived in a fantasy land a lot of the time because, you know, home was such a non, uh, healthy place to be. It was a non healthy. It was just 
there was just my mother was my parents were young my dad was very abusive my mother just could not handle having kids you know what i mean like she just wasn't able to navigate motherhood very easily she was very reactive right yeah. everything was well just wait till your father gets home yeah you know so it's just like her parenting was basically threatening us till yeah. my father got home it sounds so, like that was so like anxiety like the anxiety. oh you would just be on eggshells all the time yeah my dad would come home and just scatter like mice just everybody you couldn't would be around him no no because he'd come home and if just something wasn't to his liking and he you were the one that he caught eyes on then you know it was just the the relentless it wasn't physically abusive all the time but it was the threat of and he was just so scary verbally and emotionally abusive was he a big guy not not a big guy but very intimidating about five nine um 165 pounds but great shape a former marine so he had a very like drill sergeant marine type presence if you think of like the the guy from uh, full metal jacket the yeah, yeah. the uh you know i guess the the drill sergeant yeah. in, in full metal jacket that is very much my dad or like buzz cut from beavis and butthead if you remember the gym, <laughs> yeah. the gym that, my dad actually looks just like him okay so he looks like a hard ass yeah jarhead yeah um and as a kid like i that just seems like the worst thing to beat up on a little kid. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like he would, he would just, would you have like those beatings? So we didn't get beat beat until we got a little older, but it was so menacing, right? Yeah. So it was the screaming and it was like the, the midnight waking up hearing my mother cry. Yeah. Right. So I'd hear that I'd wake up at like, as he would get, he'd get up early for work. Yeah. Right. The guy works seven days a week for like 20, 30 years. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I would hear him just belittling her. And I wasn't sure if he was putting hands on her or not. I could just hear her crying. Yeah. And I would just be like hiding under my covers, like yeah. hoping that he wasn't going to come in there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the fit, like he, he wasn't physically abusive most of the time. Yeah. Uh, but very, very honestly, I would have rather took in the ass whooping because once you get beat, it's over. Yeah. Right. So once you get your ass kicked yeah, I get or you it. get smacked, that's it. The, the, yeah. the tension's down. You can go just yeah. cry and fucking get yeah. over it. But it was the, the waiting for the impending threat that never came would constantly keep you on eggshells psychologically. Was there a moment where you just felt you couldn't take it anymore and when you I, were done with this? Oh, when I was 15, I beat him up. Yeah. 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 A, a, in my bedroom. Uh, he came in and, uh, I don't know, he was yelling at me for something and I told him to shut the fuck up and, uh. He slapped me, and I remember, like, prior to this, I knew I could beat up grown men because uh -huh. I was already beating up grown men. Yeah. I, I got, you know, I wrestled in high school, and I was good. Yeah. And, um, and so I picked him up, body slammed him, strangled him, elbowed him a few times, nearly put him out, and um, left him on the floor. And then, I, I, honestly, I thought I would feel better after that. Like, I slayed some kind of dragon, right. but I didn't feel better after that. I right. actually felt, I felt numb. Um, I felt numb because I think, I think deep down I did want a father, Ex you everyone know, does. right. And so for me, I was like, Hmm, my prospects of having a dad now are probably dead. Yeah. And so, yeah, I went very numb after that. And like my violence in the street got much more cruel. Um, I went from like liking to fight to being cruel and like sometimes borderline torturing kids in the street, were psychologically, you, physically, and otherwise. Do you think you were trying to like get back at your dad no no uh, what i was doing I, was, I, I felt safe so if i could make enough people scared of me then they couldn't hurt me right right and so i would just do wild shit just wild unexpected random acts of violence just at you know at any how, time how was your relationship with your dad after you beat him up not good for a long time we're good we're cool now okay. um uh, i think yesterday was his birthday actually but um and uh not cool enough to know that it was his yeah, birthday yeah no, no, we, we talked yesterday <laughs> okay, yeah, cool. yeah yeah um and uh it was strained for a long time he slept i remember he told me that he slept with a bat under his bed after that for years and there wow. was a time where we went and just called silence for years we could just we could be in the same room but there would be no energetic exchange whatsoever it would just wow. be like two ghosts passing but you still you still stayed in that house until I was in and out of that house for a long time. I was homeless on and off for quite a few periods of time. Once I, after 15, I started really getting in more and more trouble. Um, I was, I was out, I was robbing people, uh, setting up drug deals, robbing the guys when they got there. 
And uh, sometimes they would come to the house in the middle of the night, throw hammers through the window, a car full of kids would roll up and, you know, try to scrap. And Where then... were these drug dealers? On Long Island? On or... Long Island. Okay. Yeah. 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 And uh, how would you rob them? With you'd, be, you'd have a gun? I would usually just do it barehanded. Really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You would just, like, basically, like, beat the shit out of them and take their shit. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I would, you know, sometimes I wouldn't even have to. After... Well, wouldn't you worry about them having a knife or a gun or something? I thought I was invisible. I thought I was invincible. invincible so, yeah. I'll tell you a story. I was about... I was 17, and... um was this guy, John, in the neighborhood. He was older. He was much older. He was in his 20s at the time. And he would hang out with high school kids, but he was older and he sold coke. And um, so one of my things was I, I would always be like the middleman. I could get this for you, you know, um, and just give me the money and I'll get it. And, use, and obviously I wouldn't give him the money most of the time. So he picks me up one day and he's got this kid, Nitty, in the car. Nitty's 14 years old at the time, right? And um, he's a little black kid from the neighborhood his mom was a lunch lady that used to sell us weed and uh <clears throat> so was that at your school yeah at our school that was <laughs> selling us weed. Weed. yeah <laughs> yeah really yeah funny. loretta um loretta. she since passed away rest in peace loretta um but uh so john drives me and i'm like i point out a random house i'm like all right that's where the house is so go park down the street because he doesn't want any attention to his house i'll walk over to the house so i have him park in this parking lot, it was an IGHL parking lot. It was like a place where uh, mentally handicapped people would go for the like day training. You know, it'd mm-hmm. be like a place for them to go do things. So I had him go park at the IGHL place. He gave me, I don't know, seven, eight hundred bucks to, to get him some coke. And uh, I walked to the house. Well, I didn't walk to the house. I walked straight down the train tracks to my neighborhood. So there was a, a set of train tracks right there in between the IGHL train tracks, the house where the supposed coke dealer lived where I was going to pick up his coke. So I just went down the tracks and walked back to my neighborhood and just left them sitting there in the parking lot. I go back down the street. Uh, I go hang out where my boys are. So everybody would hang out at this kid, Greg's house. Greg was a few years older than us. His parents just let all the neighborhood kids hang out there. So it was just a, a hangout for all the worst people in the world would hang out at this guy's house. But it was also a safe place for us to be because at least we wouldn't be out in the street. But yeah, I had met every connect I, uh, and, and bad habit. I picked up a lot of them at, at Greg's house. Um, and so John and Nitty come cruising down the street and uh, Nitty's sitting in the window and John's basically like, yo, you're going to give me my money back and you're going to shoot. I'm going to shoot you. And uh, and so I just start walking towards the car and I'm threatening. I'm like, go ahead, pull it, motherfucker, pull it. I dare you to pull it. As I, 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 I had a, I just, I didn't feel like he had murder in his blood and I didn't give a fuck. So I got right up to the car window and they took off. Wow. And, then, and so now mind you, I'm, 16, 17 when this happens, right? And this yeah. is a grown ass man. Were you like man. the same size? No, nah, I was 140 pounds. Really? Crazy as fuck though. And I could fight, you know? Um, I could fight. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and he knew this. Like they seen me pick people up, turn them upside down and drop them on the Because you're a good head. wrestler. You're a good wrestler. So I would just body slam people on pavement. Yeah. And um, and yes, people didn't train. Were you like me. Were you like a competitive wrestler? Like I wrestled in high school. You yeah. wrestled in high school? Yeah. Did and you like go to the States or anything? I got kicked out after a year and a half, but I did really well at Greco-Roman. So I started late. I started when I was 15. And, uh, the, I, and I, I was JV that first year, but then I went and did Greco-Roman, which is like the yes. Olympic style. Yeah. And I actually placed at the States and then the yeah. Northeast Regionals. I was like a wrestler my, too. My, my first year yeah. wrestling. Yeah. So I was like, oh, what I did. class? Uh, 140. Yeah, little at the yeah. time. Little. Yeah. Um, so I... I Greco-Roman, I was really talented at, and yeah. and, uh, and then and I got I got good at, at high school wrestling as well, but I got kicked out of school, so I couldn't do it. Yeah, uh, yeah. and I, I started wrestling again later kicked on. Kicked out of school for fighting, fighting drugs, um, uh, just not going. Yeah, you know? uh, just the overall reputation of so uh, people were scared of you. Scared of me, right? It's funny, like I'm thinking of, like Debo from Friday. Nah, when you're small, small. <laughs> yeah, so so I didn't feel like a bully. Yeah, because I'm like, yo, I'm littler than everybody else. Yeah, right. So imagine being 16. And then all my boys just saw me punk this dude. Yeah. Right? He drives off. And it's like, I feel like God at that time. Mm-hmm. Right? And so, and all the feedback that I'm getting from my environment is that, like, yeah, I'm just building up this character. I'm invincible. Right. You know? And, and, and so, I got to keep doing more and more wild shit. Right. So that I could keep this up. Because, to be honest, deep down, I didn't, probably didn't believe it. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. But as long as I got y'all to believe it, uh-huh. then... And cool. Yeah. All right. I'll just right. keep rocking with that. Yeah. Um, how do you get the cauliflower ears? 
This I got my first year wrestling. Su- summer oh, wrestling really? is, is freestyle and Greco. I'm uh, I'm beaten up on the heavyweight during freestyle. We're having a freestyle practice. It's after season. It was close to, to close to the end of the school year, so like April May, and uh, I'm beating up on a heavyweight. And uh, my coach Juan, uh, one of the freestyle coaches, Juan grabs me. He's like, "Oh, you like beating him up and, and being a bully." I'm like, he's a heavyweight. I'm not being a bully. I'm just, <laughs> but anyway, so Juan starts roughing me up and he's kind of like giving me like elbows, but not really to the back of the head, uh-huh. kind of just, like, just, just, just roughing me up a little bit. Uh-huh. And then I go upstairs and this hot girl, Marissa looks at me and she's like, Oh my God, what the fuck happened to your ear? And I'm like, what do you mean? And so, you know, like a fresh cauliflower ear, it's yeah. full and puffy, yeah, right? Yeah. It's not like it looks like right now, which doesn't look great, but it's, yeah full and puffy so this my ear is this huge bubble full of blood i'm yeah, like yeah. what the fuck and uh so I was, I was horrified but then i went to go get it drained and they kept draining How do they it drain it they just stick a needle in it and, and what comes out is it clear some clear some blood some all types of fluid yeah like, yeah like limp like fluid and blood no pus okay no pus all it actually is is calcified blood oh really right so the, the, this is hard Un- it's hard it's hard and the the part that's like unshapely is just the blood and how it calcifies and it pushes the skin to look deformed yeah um that shit must have hurt yeah when it's I, fresh I, it hurts I've like fuck. It, i heard yeah. like that yeah it hurts when it's so fresh right now it doesn't hurt at all it's yeah. just like a piece of rock yeah. um so yeah i've had this since i'm 15 years old and the other one uh this one i got so once i got out of the, the home I was living in, I graduated from there and I started wrestling with these Russian guys in the city because um, I really wanted to get good at Greco-Roman. So I started going into Brooklyn to train in, in this Russian community with a bunch of savages. And um, yeah, this just started to take shape after that. You know, was, you don't remember like the exact time that it tweaked? This, this one has like phases to it. So yeah. this came in first and then this sort of filled in. And you felt it when it happened. Yeah. Like, ugh. Right? Yeah. yeah. Actually, I think, is this my first year? I think this, I think this one. But I, I could also see that like you have so much adrenaline pumping when you're in it wrestling. Oh, at the time, yeah, it doesn't hurt. It hurts yeah. after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it hurts after. Yeah. And then while you try to wrestle while it's fresh after, then it hurts. Yeah. But yeah, when it first pops and breaks, it doesn't hurt. So you get kicked out of school and you loved wrestling. So that kind of sparked your career because you needed a place to compete right yeah yeah so you know even even being like so i'd have these bouts where i'm homeless and i'm like i'm fu- i'm fucked up i'm out of school homeless on long island homeless on long island yeah where would you where would you be i'd homeless? live in the woods usually the woods. yeah so like my my homeboy greg he had this abandoned truck that was in the woods behind his house like uh-huh. so there's like you could have a block and there's patches of like woods you know yeah uh, know. it's not like a forest but yeah. it's just like patches of, of yeah. un, uncleared land yeah and um so there's a big old truck back there like a big ford bronco a giant one and i would just sleep in that um a lot of the times uh, i would sleep in there i'd bring blankets in there i'd have my bags of clothes with me and then i'd get up and like his sister would let me shower in the house in the morning uh-huh. before i would go out and do my thing um or sometimes i would uh i would steal people's lawn furniture and just throw it in like in, a, in the woods in the back there would be this um a bunch of rolled up chain link fence so it was, they were going to use it for fence but they didn't and so it had a little bit of spring to it right. but you wouldn't want to just sleep on just that cuz yeah. it's, it's metal yeah, but yeah. then i would put the mattress over that and i could sleep on that in the woods so you'd sleep on a bed were you, were you working while you were homeless I was just robbing people you just robbing people yeah. uh, robbing people burglaries theft whatever i could get my hands on what kinds of theft and burglary uh did you do home invasions yeah yeah i, I would so um a lot of times i would um, I'd scout out if I knew like particular kids in my school, if I knew their parents worked, i will just run up in their house and fucking steal whatever I could. You'd if they run was... up in their house. Yeah. Just run up in the house and, and doors unlocked. I'd find a way in. Yeah. To the window. Windows. Sometimes they leave the door unlocked. What time are we talking? Usually like 10 AM. Okay. Yeah. So, 10 AM so... would be enough time where he's at school. They're, they're out of they're the at house. work. They're yeah. out of the house. Yeah. Right. And so sometimes I didn't know at all. Sometimes I'd just be random as fuck and just go in. But, uh, um, but yeah, a lot of times I would, I would know, okay, no one's home. So then I'd go in through the window. Um, most of the times it was windows. I was little, so I could fit through windows back then. Uh-huh. Um, 
And sometimes you'd have to check all the windows. There would be like the one that they, they didn't lock. Yeah. And, uh, so I'd get in through that window. A lot of times it was kitchen windows for some reason. And then you'd have to like go over the sink. <laughs> so the kitchen window would be like over sitting the, the, yeah. the sink and the counter. I remember quite often like popping my head through a window and like getting into like having to like navigate, getting over the sink and yeah. onto the floor. Uh, and then, yeah, just search for valuables and drink whatever liquor they had in the house. <sighs> I uh, sat early in the morning. Yeah, I would always drink their liquor. So I got so comfortable. This one kid's house, I would rob it all the time, right? I would rob it all the time. And I got so comfortable, I'd be like making myself cocktails in there and just like relaxing and like having a good time. And then like, I remember one day being in there having a drink and I hear a fucking car door shut as parents come home. So I'm like, fuck. So I go down to the basement, I have to hide. And then I, uh, they had um, cellar doors that opened up like I don't know if they have them in California so I much know exactly but, but they have them about. on the east coast they're outside yeah. you open it up yeah yeah like on. metal doors yep. to go into a basement yep. right and uh yeah so I just split out the cellar doors and fucking ran into the woods and, and dove in and uh it's a close call close fucking call that dude. was the closest call you had as far as burglarizing a house no I I had a closer call one time me and my friends cut school and uh which I don't even know if we were going to school at the time to be honest but just not a went um and we broke into a house, um, and we were uh, this kid had a bunch of valuable baseball cards. So we didn't really get shit, right? I got a, I got some cards that I actually was able to sell and, and make some loot off of, and we stole like a grip of change. Um, and mind you, this is the '90s, right? So to go to the store and get like a couple of '40s, or you could even get a nickel bag of weed at the time, like that existed, yeah. right? And some cigarettes or blunts, like yeah. didn't cost a whole lot, right? Yeah. You could have a fucking Sick day with like 10, 20 bucks. We're uh-huh. fucked straight. Um, and uh, this girl was actually my my brother's wife at now saw us breaking into the house. It was her neighbor. She called the cops. And while we're walking, the cops fucking pull us over. But they have no evidence that we were actually in the house because we didn't have any of the shit on us. Yeah. And uh, they have us lined up against the car. And my boy Chris, who I was with, his dad comes driving down the street and sees us all lined up against the car. Oh. We were more scared of the pops than yeah. fucking, yeah. His, his dad is this fuck crazy French guy, Rene, um, that he's chased me a few times, like, to, to, to fight me. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. So you're beating up grown men at that stage? Yeah. Yeah. And wh- how would you get into fights then? Because you were fighting frequently. You would still pick fights? Yeah. It just Maybe I robbed somebody and they don't want to get robbed. Right. Maybe I'm, um, you know, fucking throwing snowballs at a car during the winter time just to be a dick. You know what That's I mean? That's kind like, of shit. Like, that like kids an, get into. any kind of way that I could kick up some shit, yeah. I'll kick up some shit. Yeah. You know, like it wasn't it wasn't hard to get into a fight. And fucking New York, like people are not in a good mood generally, so yeah. it's, it's not easy. People are they're a bit more aggressive in, yeah. in New York, particularly like California. Would be like quite hard to get into a fight. You know, like in, uh, <laughs> you've tried. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm. I, I, yeah, like, I know I, I'd be the first. You yeah. would really have to. I think even if somebody was to hit me, I'd probably let them walk away. Yeah, as long it's, as it wasn't my life wasn't you know, in danger. No, it's not worth it. Because what I'm going to do to them is not worth it. Yeah, you know, like it's yeah. just it's not it's not equal. I'm not in danger. If you hit me, I'm not in danger. Well, if anyone's in danger. You never know. That guy could have a knife. You know, could have a knife. You know, yeah. I would have to feel know. in danger. If I yeah. felt in danger. Yeah. Then, then it's a different story. If I don't feel in danger, then I'm probably going to give you a pass. You must have gotten in a fight where someone had something, a gun or yeah, a knife. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. I remember I was, uh, I was out with my friend Tim, and we, uh, we went to go hang out with some girls. And so we took a train to get there in another town a little bit ways away. We go hang out with these girls, and on our way back, we're at a bowling alley, and this kid's there, and he's selling weed. And uh, I'm like, yo, let me buy some weed. I think he gave me like a half ounce of weed. And so I put it in my pocket and I, and I just walked out and the kid chased me outside. So I picked the kid, I suplexed this kid like two or three times in the parking lot and just left him there like yeah. a mess, right? Just picked him up, dropped him on his head a couple of times. I leave, I go to the train station. The motherfucker comes back like 15, 20 minutes later with a fucking Bowie knife. Oh boy. And I'm like, oh fuck, I fucked up. So I like jumped down onto the tracks. I'm like, how can I get away from this? You know, and I'm like, at first, I thought, I'm like, all right, let me see if I could disarm this motherfucker. Uh-huh. And then, I, and then the knife was just so big. I was like, ah, it kills me to give him his weed back. It fucking tore out my soul to give this guy his weed back. But I'm like, all right, man, fucking, I'm going to take the L this time. So here, here's your so weed when back. So you, when you steal the drugs, you would sell the drugs or just use the drugs? I would use them most of the time or sell them. A little yeah. bit of both. Yeah. A little bit of both. Um, so 
Yeah. So, it, but the thing is, I was such a fucking junkie. You know what I mean? Like, I sold drugs my whole teenage years. I definitely never made a profit. Right. Uh-huh. I just wouldn't pay it back, and it was uh-huh. just like your loss, homie. Unless it was like one of the big homies, then I would have yeah. to pay them back. You know. But um, I uh. I so fr- you were on heroin at the time? No, no, no. But when I say junkie, just I lived like a junkie. So I didn't right. do heroin. Yeah. But I, I, I have a lot of friends and junkies from rehab over the years, right. and we are the same. I, just, <laughs> <laughs> I needed to do, I needed, I just needed to not hate myself, mm. right? And I hated myself right. at that age. I, I was just filled with self loathing. And so anything I could get my hands on to not feel like that. Yeah. Um, so he like this will give you a perfect example of like how I was with getting my hands on something. I uh it's like I'm 17 18, uh, I'm I'm dropped out of school for sure cuz I'm sitting home and it's it's like June cuz it's hot out, all right? So it's the end of the school year and uh my boy Marco hits me up. Me and Marco used to do a lot of dirt together. Marco was in 8th grade he was benching like 330. Wow. And in high school he was just a fucking mutant he was a powerlifting mutant and he was beating up grown men in eighth grade like yeah. he was he was a bad man he was already a legend in eighth grade yeah. like, and uh and he just got more and more so uh yeah. marco was feared and marco was a fucking arch criminal and, and so was i uh and, and uh he called me up he's like yo my nickname was bun um so i was like yo bun i got i got some work you want you down to get down so i was like yeah just come over let me know what's going on so he cruises over he's got this like gold buick lesabre like old piece of shit right um this guy made millions on the street and fucking always drove a piece of shit and <laughs> so uh but he wasn't like deep in the game at this time we were still doing like petty crime so it's like all right yo so there's this dude he lives in mastic he's he's moving some weight but uh but he's got a gun in the house i want you to get a i want you to go in and get the gun right so he's not home right now so we're gonna go in we're gonna break in I'm going to break in and you're going to get the gun. So like it's midday, right? So like 11 o'clock in the morning, I'm like, hold on, I need to get my outfit on. So <laughs> I have this robbing outfit, right? I had these black nylon hockey pants. Isn't that bad in the middle of the day? Terrible. Yeah. <laughs> terrible. Terrible. So stupid, right? But th- this is my logic, right? Yeah. So these black nylon hockey pants, I got my black hoodie and then I've got a uh, black ski mask that had like a foam face. So you couldn't see the, the, the shape of my face. Ah. Um, which still it's the middle of the fucking summertime. Yeah. Still stupid. Yeah. Right. Uh, and Mark's got a crowbar in the car. So we cruise down to Mastic. Mastic is a real shithole neighborhood on Long Island, right? Real dredge of the earth type place. And, uh, so he's like, all right, that's the house right there. I'm going to park up the block. Just go take care of that. And I'll, I'll be right here. So I get to the door and what I realize is that the, the apartment is adjacent to another apartment. I think it was actually his family's apartment. I think he had a separate, like a little small apartment connected to his family's house. And the window is like right here. It's open and I can smell the bacon being cooked as the family is in there. But this guy lives in a separate door. So I'm literally listening to these people prepare breakfast while I'm jimmying this door open with a crowbar at 11 o'clock in the morning. Not, I didn't think anything about what if they hear me. Yeah. Nothing like that. So like consequential thinking did not exist in my mind at this time. Like yeah. I'm invincible yeah. and these people can't touch me. So I jimmy the door open, right? I get in and I'm looking around. I can't find nothing. The apartment's a fucking mess, right? It's dark, right? And so I'm looking around, looking around. I can't find anything. All of a sudden, his customers start coming to the door. The guy's a crack dealer. And so one of the base heads comes to the door and I'm like, they're like, yo, is uh, so-and-so home? I don't even remember that kid's name. And I'm like, uh, no, but I'm his cousin, Tony, you know, don't worry about it. I got the ski mask off at this time. So don't worry. He'll, he'll be home in a little bit. Uh, you want me to leave him a message, right? Just, like, just tell him I stopped by. Then his fucking girlfriend comes to the door, right? And she looks, sc- and I'm standing there with a crowbar. Like, yeah, I'm his, <laughs> I'm his cousin, Tony, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> she's looked at, like I know she's not buying the story but I don't care I don't even leave at that point what I'm worried about is I told Mark I was going to get this job done I can't go back empty handed yeah right so I can't find this fucking gun nowhere but I go in I find a Tupperware full of crack right mm-hmm. so I'm like fuck yeah jackpot I got something I'm like it's not the gun but at least he's not going to be mad yeah. that I come back with this so I come back we maybe got like an ounce of crack right and it was just decent money at yeah. that time. It was a few hundred dollars at least, you know. Um, that, that's it? 
probably more. Now it's probably a few hundred bucks. Uh, uh, back then it was, it was, it was quite expensive. Yeah. Uh, well, a few hundred dollars would be quite expensive back then. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Coke was a lot cheaper yeah. in, in the nineties. Um, and so I didn't really fuck with crack. Uh-huh. You know, I've smoked it a few times, right? Yeah. And, but it wasn't my thing, right? I liked cocaine. I liked all the other drugs, but I didn't, crack was, you know, it was whatever. Um, so I'm like, and I never sold crack. So I don't know mm-hmm. how to sell crack. I don't know what it's valued at. And so we're like, all right, we go back and we got this Tupperware. And we're like, well, what are we going to do with it? He's like, all right, we'll take it to one of our boys, one of both of our like big homie, right? This guy kind of like, he knew what was up and, and he'd been in, in the game for a long time. And, and we'll get it valued. So we go to him, we get the value. Again, a few hundred dollars, maybe more than a few hundred dollars. I, I don't remember. Um, he's not, he doesn't want to buy it because he doesn't fuck with that shit. So we split it in half, right? I take my half, he takes his half. And I fucking, I want to sell it because I want to have a come up. I want to get some money. Crack's not my thing. But then there's this other voice in my head that's like, oh, I could get high right now. I got all this crack, mm-hmm. right? But I don't smoke crack. Right. And even though I'm a dirtbag, smoking crack is a real dirtbag shit yeah. in my head. But so I'm like, I'm having this internal tug of war and I'm like, you know, fighting with myself. And so I walk to go find my friends. No one's around, but my boy Johnny's around. Right. And Johnny was, whenever I wanted to go to like the dark, dark darkness of drugs, I would get Johnny boy with me. Right. Johnny boy is no longer with us, but he was a, he was a beautiful soul. And no matter, uh, <laughs> What kind of shit we got into, he would always have a smile on his face. And, and uh, he was just a fun guy to be around. So if I was going to smoke crack and go into the dark, I want to do it with Johnny. Because at least I'll have a pleasant person with me. Yeah. <laughs> right? And uh, so we, we go to the train tracks. And my, my best friend, Chris, he wasn't home, but his little brother was home, Paulie. Paulie was like four years younger than me. So if I'm 17, 18, Paulie's four years younger than that. He's a kid. Right. And so he's following along with us, riding his bike. And we go up onto the train track. We make a little bong out of a soda bottle. And we're like, we start smoking the rock on the train tracks. And I'm looking at Paulie and I feel like such a dirt bag. And I felt like obliged to be like, don't ever do this, Paulie. Whatever you see us doing right now, don't ever do this. And he never grew up like into drugs or anything like that. Thank God. But it was like, we're just such shit role models for this kid. All he saw us do was commit crimes, do drugs, and just be complete degenerates. But I just remember looking at this kid while I'm smoking this crack out of a soda bottle bong. And, you know, after a little bit, I was like, all right, I'm fucking, I need to get rid of this. Otherwise, I'm going to smoke it all. And so I went to the homie Greg, who, whose truck that I used to sleep in. And I said, uh, you know, I got this crack. I'll trade it to you because I know you got some acid. Mm. Right. And I was like, acid's the most bang you can get for your buck. And it's definitely more enjoyable long term than, than crack. And so it took Did like you enjoy little- the crack? I mean, it's the initial rush of smoking crack is great. Yeah. After that, you're just chasing the dragon. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And you can't yeah. get it back. And yeah. then once my paranoia starts kicking in, because I get real paranoid. If I've been like in a cocaine psychosis for, yeah. I've been up for a long enough time. Yeah. It's not pretty. I think the feds are after me and I'm yeah. looking in the trees for the cops and fucking, right. you know, all that story. Yeah. Blind sketch and yeah. searching the carpet for fucking crumbs and smoking deodorant because it looks like crack. <laughs> and, you know, like that happens. Um, that's not fun, right? Yeah, that that's sounds not horrible. fun. Acid is fun you're right um and so i was like oh man just i, I wanted him to trade me just a, i was like i'll trade you a little of this because i figured i still could have gotten paid off the crack right and he fucking he knew me he knew like i was so impulsive and i couldn't wait so uh-huh. i just traded him all the rock for like i don't know 10 12 hits of acid yeah and it was like and I, so like for all that and i you know i did all the acid in like one shot and then it was just like that was it yeah. All that work, all that trouble that I put myself in, and I, I came up with nothing. Yeah. You know what I mean? I smoked a little bit of crack on the train tracks. I traded my soul because I knew doing drugs wasn't a good thing. You know, remember, it's like the war on drugs time, right? So drugs uh, are bad. Yeah. Right? This is, the, this is the 90s. Yeah. Right? So drugs are bad. And you're, you know, weed is whatever, right? But every time I would move to a harder drug, it felt like I was making a concession with my soul. Like, like I knew... This isn't good. Right. Right. And I, I could feel that. But You're I was willing, intentionally doing something but I was, bad. I was intentionally disregarding my, like, my worth as a human to, right. to smoke rock. Right. You know, because I, I couldn't sit with myself. Exactly. I didn't know that at the time. Right. It didn't feel good. Right. You know, it didn't You're feel You're punishing good. yourself. Punishing myself. Yeah, yeah. Making this concession 
that, you know, every time like, when you concede your values to something, it's not empowering. Right. <laughs> you know no, what I mean? Absolutely. Not. And so I did all this work. Yeah. You know, put myself in real, like I could have yeah. got, first of all, guys, a crack dealer with a gun in the house. Yeah. Right? So it's like, I could have got killed just on that operation alone. I could have yeah. got arrested. Right. Yeah. I could have gotten some kind of scuffle with either the homeowners next door or somebody coming in that would have been, you know, not only am I robbing the house, but I'm committing violence inside the house. You know what kind of jail time you're going to do for that? Like, uh-huh. you, you're yeah. going to get some time for yeah, that. Yeah. Like there's, there's no, no, no offense or buts. Right. So I put myself in all this stupid trouble just to get high. Yeah. Just to get high for the day. Yeah. That's it. And I, I, I woke up the next morning with nothing to show for it. Yeah. You know, so I was so short sighted. Like it was never the long term game. Right. It was always about how can I feel better now? Did you, did you feel like this about it after it happened? Was I this like a turning point? No, no, I was <laughs> done. Fuck no, dude. I didn't get sober till I was 23. Oh, wow. Yeah. I yeah. got sober when I was 23. Uh, so I've been sober like. Is that when you years. put the crime behind you too? Yeah, yeah, largely. And I, I had some, I bounced in nightclubs in New York during uh-huh. sobriety. So from 24 to 28, 29, I worked in, in nightclubs. Um, Manhattan? Not so much Manhattan, mostly Long Island and the Hamptons. Okay. Um, and the Hamptons nightclub scene was, was pretty lit back then. Yeah. And uh, we had our own little <laughs> organized crime going against the bouncers. And we can get into some of those stories too. Yeah. Um, uh, but, um, yeah, so that that I, I like that story really just illustrates like you the know, futility. Just yeah, like that's how I was not thinking about anything past now. Yeah, nothing past now. Yeah. Nothing past now, and I would walk towards the car and dare yeah. John to shoot me. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, Where did that invincibility I, sense come from? It was because you won so many fights. Won so many fights. I was little. Yeah, um, and just the the respect that people would give me. Because I was so little. Yeah. And I just felt good. I felt empowered. Like, people wanted to be around me. You know what I mean? Like, girls didn't because I was crazy, right? (laughs) That kind of bit me in the ass. Yeah. Uh, I didn't figure that part of the equation. But dudes fucking sweat me hard. Every dude wanted to be my friend. Right. Every dude wanted to be my friend. Um, You and your buddy who you were doing petty crimes with the guy. Big Mark. Big Mark. Uh, You said that you started doing bigger crimes with him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, dude, we did some funny shit. Me and him would just drive around sometimes and uh, and see, like, because, man, it's so, it's so weird how different this is. Like, kids would hang out in parking lots back then. Like, again, this is the 90s, so it's a yeah. different, 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 different era. Kids would, there'd be just groups of kids, cars parked, hanging out in parking lots, whatever, right. smoking blunts, drinking, whatnot. And we would just roll up and just start robbing these fools, like, all the time. Um, if, like, we knew, like a kid that was selling drugs was going out to the club that night during the summertime. Mark would pick me up, throw me through the window to go in and like get whatever I could find and come out with it. Like, and these were people like we, we knew these guys, we weren't enemies with them, but we weren't friends with them, but we were like, right. we'd say what up to them if we saw them. Yeah. You know what I mean? But not good enough not to rob them or yeah. rob their house, you know? So yeah, he would, he would like middle, you know, middle of the night, just, the screen was too high for me to get up, so we'd have to like bust the window, and then Mark would throw me through the window. Right. And he's a big guy, so he could fucking he could just pick. And I was little, so he just tossed my little ass through the window and go in and fence whatever we could fence in there. When when you would rob someone directly, like uh-huh. to say like just like a stick up, you stick up. Like how often would you actually have to fight that person? Rarely. 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 Sometimes. Sometimes. Sometimes I have to turn somebody on their head. You know, just like. You know, it's one thing to hit somebody. When you body slam somebody on the head on the concrete, it's a different story. It, yeah. it just, and when you see that happen, yeah, I don't want no part of that because it's yeah. ugly. Like people go into convulsions and stuff like that. Like I've, I've caught, uh, I've, I've I've done uh, I've caught charges for that and and you know gotten locked up for for a little bit for um for assaults that look just like that. I was uh I was hanging out with I was, I'm on probation or actually I'm I'm in I'm in the middle of uh going to court for an armed robbery, right? And I'm hanging out with my boys and we're smoking weed and I know I'm fucking up. You know what I mean? Like I'm sitting in the car. This is the worst feeling in the world. Knowing you're facing time, right? Knowing that probation, jail time at least are coming, right? right. And that I'm fucking up. Like I know my life is going nowhere and I'm sitting at a dead end with my, my homie Dwayne and these two girls. And the gr- girl's driving the car, this girl Tara. And we're smoking at a dead end. 
And all of a sudden, this truck comes out. Big ass monster truck. Flashing the lights, getting on the horn. The girl gets nervous, so she leaves. The fucking truck starts chasing her, right? And uh, chasing her down the highway. And this girl's nervous. She's not a criminal. She's not one of us. You know, right. she's a nice little girl. And so she's nervous. And so this guy's like chasing her and scaring her and almost like could have could have got us killed because she's panicking behind the wheel. So she manages to like ditch the truck. We pull into a parking lot. And uh, it was this dude, Tommy, who was like a neighborhood psychopath, uh, big older guy, and, and a couple of his boys. And one of the guys with him was my age. And he was laughing when they got out of the truck. And uh, we, we, they, they caught up to us at a gas station. And he was laughing when he got out of the truck. And I was like, oh, you think that's funny? Yeah. Um, and so I hit the kid. He bounces off the truck and comes back at me with his fist cocked like uh-huh. this. And I remember I swooped underneath him. Jumped in the air. I don't know if you remember Street Fighter. There was a character named Zangief that would do these fucking it. twisty, twisted him in the air. And we both came down, like both of our feet are in the air. And we both come down on top of his head. And he went to catch himself um, as uh-huh. we hit the ground. And so uh, he had a compound fracture. The bone right. snapped out of the arm. Oof. And uh, and he was kind of like, you know, doing the uh, the the dead seizure when the people's they pass out and they're just yeah, seizing. Yeah, yeah. And um and then I got up and kicked him a couple times. And then my my, my boy John uh so you know, E, you gotta get the fuck out of here. Like he, like go, go, go. Uh and so it turned out the kid had a um compound fracture, his skull was fractured and um and his ribs were broken. And uh just left him on the floor like that. And I don't I don't never felt bad about that one. Um I almost got killed over that because the the guy who he his his like guy that was looking after him that guy tommy um <clears throat> wanted to, wanted to shoot me over that uh mm-hmm. and then i had to have somebody else have a word with him to yeah. uh to uh kind of quell that and let that you, not you narrowly escape like death it seems like a lot of times a lot of times yeah yeah what was the most you got actually got fucked up oh, you man. must have lost some of those fights okay so i'm gonna tell you a string of stories that happened okay. within that happened within a month or two of each other. Mm-hmm. Okay. And this is where I lost my invincibility. Right. Okay. Um, and ultimately saved my life. Right. This, this happened. Right. So, and I don't remember the order in which they happened. I just know that they happened close to one another. So right. I'll, I'll give it to you the best that I can. Um, one night, um, I'm out drinking with uh, some older friends. And yeah, maybe I'm 18 at the time. And we... Uh, we go out drinking in the Hamptons and we're, uh, I don't know, we get fucked up, blackout drunk. And they drop me off at where my parents' house was. But I didn't want them to know that I was homeless. So I told them to drop me off at my parents' house. But then I would walk and go sleep in the woods because I was embarrassed. Mm-hmm. And um, I fell asleep on the train tracks. Like on the fucking tracks. Right. Blacked out. And, and uh, you know, when you're in a blackout, you're in a blackout. You fucking don't wake up usually till the next day. Mm-hmm. And... <sighs> I, I feel like, I guess the vibration woke my body up and the train is coming down the tracks and I like sit up and I, all I see is this beaming light coming straight for me. And I didn't have the coherence to like get up, but mm-hmm. I fell and rolled off the tracks and watched it pass by. Phew. And then I remember like going home and like crying to my mother, like I, I fucking don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to die. Like how old were you? 18. Yeah. And, uh, crying to her and I, I didn't know what to do like and I, I wanted help but I, I just couldn't do anything I just and I couldn't stay sober I just couldn't stay sober I've been trying to stay sober for a while and I just couldn't you know um, I've been seeing professionals about my drug use since I'm 14 and, uh. and I just couldn't stay sober no matter what um, and so a few weeks after that I, actually I think I got sober after that I did I stayed sober for about four weeks after that okay that this, this is making sense now um, it's all jumbled because I was so fucked up at the time yeah um, it's a long time ago yeah too. it's also a very long yeah. time ago uh, a couple weeks later so I'm sober and I'm starting to feel good right bouncing back right and uh, again I go out with one of my older friends right guys are a few years older than me in their 20s and we go to a house party and I'm I'm like all right I'm gonna do this night sober and we're sitting around the house party and 
it's cool, you know what I mean? But I'm, I'm, I'm young and I'm feeling like a little insecure at the time. Like I, I don't know how to socialize without drugs and alcohol, mm -hmm. right? And, and these are like nice white people at this party and I'm not that, you know what I mean? I'm like a fucking little hoodlum dirtbag. Right. Like these are nice, clean cut white folks. Yeah. And uh, so I always felt weird around those type of white people to begin with. And so I'm like, fuck. I'm like, uh, hey, Pat, what do you think? Let's go get a six pack. And he's like, you sure that's a good idea? I'm like, yeah, man, I haven't drank in a month. I'm just going to have, we'll split the six pack and it'll be fine. So I have a couple of beers and then somehow I end up going to a different party with my friend Dave. My friend Dave drove me there. I believe he had this like little red pickup truck at the time. And uh, so we get to this party and uh, this is a little bit more my style. The guy's a little bit more like punk rock dirt bags. You know, I was a, like punk rock kid, but I could, I could, eat, I could relax around those type mm -hmm. of kids. They were a little more, you know, a little more my, my element. And uh, um, the owner of, or the, one of the guys that lived at the house, it was a share house. One of the guys that lived at the house, he, he was selling ecstasy. He's like, oh, you guys want to buy some ecstasy? And so ecstasy was my favorite thing in the world at the time right so ecstasy in the 90s was awesome and uh so i, I take a pill i think i might have even took two and but he brings me into his room to sell me to give me the pills because he didn't he wasn't carrying them on them and he had this little drawers like attached to the frame of his bed so he had a bed and there was like a wooden frame that went down there were drawers attached to it and so in one of those drawers was the pills and his cash that he was making from selling the pills Right, and so he brings me right to where his stash is. And I remember, like, so, stupid, stupid. Move. Well, he was—he's not like a drug dealer, drug yeah, dealer. He's yeah. making a little extra money. Yeah. you know what I mean. But he also don't know who he's fucking yeah. talking to, right? Yeah. So I'm the worst person to do that around. <laughs> yeah. Like, I have to. Yeah. Right, and so I go back to the party, and I'm obviously the pills are kicking in. I'm feeling good, but you know, I would feel more than better than two pills, a lot more pills, right? So I. I'm like, I don't remember exactly. I do remember going in and taking it. I don't remember the, the series of events that happened. I remember like the pills and the cash are there, right? So I go in. Now, it's a bag full of pills, right? Bag full mm -hmm. and a bunch of cash. So the next thing I remember, well, actually, I, <laughs> the next thing I remember is I wake up handcuffed to a hospital bed, right? So I, I don't remember anything else that night. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I woke up the next morning handcuffed to a hospital bed. I'm still in trouble with the law, right? I've got pending charges. I might have even been on probation at the time. Um, and there's a cop standing there talking to the nurse. So I'm thinking, I got arrested again. I'm fucked, right? Um, I didn't get arrested again. The nurse comes over and tells me, yeah, you overdosed last night. You were cuffed because you were seizuring so badly that we had to restrain you from moving. Um, and we had to pump your stomach. You, you had overdosed. And you don't know how many pills you took? No idea. Yeah. The bag was not on me anymore. Two pills of ecstasy alone is a lot. <laughs> I would no routinely take five. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. I wouldn't even bother if I wasn't going to go like deep into the dark. Wow. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so and there's more stories about that too. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so I got, I'm like, fuck. So I go and I sign the paperwork and I'm like, oh. I just overdosed. Like, that's all it was. Like, I was happy that I overdosed and I didn't get in trouble. You know, at least I was alive, right? Um, and that overdose cost me a lot of money later on, but it, it, uh, I didn't know that at the time. I just got a medical bill like years later. Uh, um, and so I'm like, what the fuck happened? So I have no recollection of how I got there, what my evening was like. And uh, I'm like, I got a lump in my pocket. And I'm like, I fucking pull out a wad full of cash. I'm like, I didn't have this last night. I maybe had 20 bucks on me last night. I'm like, where the fuck did this come from? Um, well, I was stoked, right? And I had one shoe on. Um, I don't know where my other shoe went. So I'm like, all right. So I, I, I fucking get myself together. I sign my paperwork. I go outside. I take a taxi home. I'm in Riverhead Hospital. I take a taxi home. And uh, I get home. And I'm like, I got all this cash in my oh, pocket. Oh, that little thing came off. Whoop. Put it back on. Sometimes the wind can catch it. Makes a noise. My bad. I'm gonna grab another uh, another soda. Sure. All right. 
So I take so, the taxi home. Okay. And I'm like, oh, I need to go out drinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Straight from my overdose. And, uh, but I'm get, I, got, I got a couple calls. And mom's like, hey, your friend's called. And so I make some phone calls back. And I'm like, so okay. Yeah. I'm home. Like, took the taxi home. And I'm like, I'm going to go out drinking. Right? So no, like, no, like, let me take a minute and think. I just overdosed. Like, you know. And so my mom tells me my friend's called. So I answer the phone. I'm like, dude. We found you in the, I'm sorry, we had to call the ambulance, but we found you in the truck last night and you were convulsing and slamming your head on the dashboard repeatedly and like in like a fit and we didn't know what to do. So we called the cops, like we were worried you were going to die. And uh, so I, I didn't remember any of that. And I didn't, and like, yeah, and fucking, did you steal Jesse's money and, and all his pills? I like vehemently denied it. I'm like, dude, I don't remember what happened last night. And like, I didn't remember, but then it made sense. Like, oh, that's what, and then... I started patching the night back. Like it's weird when that shit starts yeah. to happen. When yeah. it starts to come back to you, and you start to be able to, uh, like, faint little memories. And I start putting pieces together. And I'm like, "Fuck! I did rob this motherfucker last night." But I'm not telling my friends that they're gonna, be, even though they know that I did it. And so I just vehemently denied it. But they they all knew it. And um, I went out drinking, and I was like, "Well, who am I gonna drink with?" And so I, you know, I wander into into town and. Johnny boy was hanging out at a parking lot drinking and I got money and you know, so me and Johnny boy once again in, into the depths of hell together. And we, you know, we go down to a bar where we can drink and get ourselves some cocaine and fucking, you know, all that money again was gone in a, in a, as fast as it came. How much cash was it? A few hundred dollars, three, four, 500 bucks, you know, 18 years old, 1990. Seven ninety eight. That's a lot of money. Yeah, you know, ninety nine. Yeah, maybe. that's a lot of money for. It's also easy to blow that much in a night. Yeah, 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 yeah. and just gone. You know, yeah, gone. So yeah, it wasn't the most money, but the pills that I took was worth a lot yeah. of money. Like the, the crimes you were getting into at your peak, it, w- it was still just robbing people mainly. It just riskier and riskier shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just just robbing people. Um, and then like. How often would you be fighting if you're not – the people you rob, you'd rarely fight, you said. I'd still find a way to fight. you still find – like yeah. if you like would go out drinking, you would end up in a fight usually. As a teenager, yeah. 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 As a teenager, yeah. Um, as I got – I got to when I was 23. In my 20s, didn't really have to fight so much. Um, right. I just had a reputation already. Right. Once you got a reputation, man, you become yeah. like a ghost story. Yeah. You know, people just – especially like, you know, in a neighborhood – Right. Right. Neighborhood legends and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and the, like the internet wasn't so powerful back then. Yeah. So like, you know, it's like, yeah, there were people, there were people that were like folklore. I remember like I looked up to as folklore, uh-huh. but like now I wouldn't look at like shit. I'd be like, you're a fucking chump. You know yeah, what I mean? But yeah. when I was a kid, these people were, they were like the stuff stories were made of. Right. You know, it's just, just different time. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, so that overdose happens and then the, the craziest part happens, right? So um, uh, a, f- a couple of friends of mine were out and, you know, we would always find people with houses to hang out at, right? So like sometimes at dead ends and parking lots, cops would fuck with you. The only right. place you wouldn't get fucked with is if somebody had like a, a house or an apartment, right. right? And 17, 18, you don't, not everybody has apartments. Most people still live in home, you right. know what I mean? 